Gender and Empire in Jane Eyre. And like I say, in previous lessons, we've uh, looked at the aspect of the British Empire. I uh, talked about it last week. And uh, that's one side of the analysis that I want to present today, and the, 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 the kind of uh, discussion. And we've got this uh, new, or relatively new kind of um, feminist challenge or proto-feminist challenge to male hegemony. Brought about partly because of the destabilizing of norms uh, that took place in the wake of the French Revolution and kind of epitomized in the figure of Mary Wollstonecraft, as we saw last week. Although it was really largely restating things that had been you know, uh, said before by women, uh, it, it had a new focus and it had a new energy to it. So uh, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre combines, or it's got elements of both um, narratives, the narrative of gender, the narrative of empire, and uh, it, it's very striking. It's attracted a lot of attention because of the way uh, in which it combines those two particular narratives. And as I say, it's, it's got another narrative, which is of the, the, the madness of, of Bertha, but we'll look at that, or we'll look at madness as a, a Victorian and feminist issue. Uh, we'll look at that a little bit later on in the course. Okay, so today, uh, that's what we're going to be looking at, the issues of uh, gender and empire in, in, in Jane Eyre. And... I'm going to start with uh, the idea of the Sultan and the Slave, which is a, um, the name of a, a very famous paper, which sort of opened up the, these issues, or it's one of the, the papers that opened up the issues of the dynamics of power and how it relates to gender and how it relates to kind of colonial views and, and, and all of those kinds of issues. Um, basically, we've got this young girl, she's 18, 19 years old, she becomes engaged to Mr. Rochester, and uh, after she gets engaged, this is uh, Zonana, the author of the, um, this particular paper, this is her starting point for analysis, uh, after they get engaged, he takes her shopping to get clothes and jewellery for their wedding. He's, he's kind of doing his best to dress her up as a kind of princess or something, and she doesn't want that, so there's a kind of conflict of interest. Um, after the, they, uh, they do their shopping, uh, he smiles at her, and uh, she says, I thought his smile was such as a sultan, that's, uh, you know, an Eastern, Middle Eastern kind of um, potentate, uh, a kind of prince or uh, kind of ruler in, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, the, his smile was such as a sultan might in a blissful and fond moment bestow on a slave his gold and gems had enriched. The sultans were, of course, famous for having a harem of women, a, a whole kind of, not just one wife, but a whole kind of collection of wives, uh, a harem or harem, and uh, she feels that she's, you know, he's, he's sort of treating her in that kind of way, as a sort of possession, a slave, all right? So, hence the title of the paper, The Sultan and the Slave. And uh, as I say, that's where Joyce uh, Zanana uh, takes her kind of starting point for her analysis of the uh, power and gender um, relationships in, in Jane Eyre. And uh, this is a little extract from her article where uh, she describes that shopping trip that they go on like this. On the day following Jane Eyre's betrothal, her, you know, her pledge to marry, her betrothal to uh, her master, okay, of course he is her master, but the word sort of takes on extra meanings in this situation. He's her master, Rochester. And Jane finds herself obliged, okay, uh, forced to go with him to a silk warehouse at Millcott where she is ordered to choose half a dozen dresses. So these words, master, obliged, ordered, they set up a power dynamic very clearly. He's the boss. 
Okay? It's not just that he's her husband, but he is literally her boss. She's working for him as a governess in his household. And she makes it clear that she hated the business, but she can't free herself from it. She's uh, caught up in this situation where she pretty much has to do what he says. She tries to negotiate, uh, and she manages to negotiate up to a certain point. Uh, all she can manage, though, by dint of entreaties expressed in energetic whispers, is a reduction in the number of dresses. I don't need half a dozen, okay? That's too many. Um, uh, though these, Rochester vowed he would select himself. He says, okay, well, we don't, it doesn't have to be six, I'll get you three or four, but uh, I, I'm going to choose them. So he's, you know, the power that he's, she's negotiating, but he's not giving her very much. He might compromise a little bit. Uh, she, she protests uh, and with infinite difficulty secures Rochester's grudging acceptance of her choice, a sober black satin and pearl grey silk. So in the end, she, she manages to get what she wants. Um, her choice is a sober black satin and a pearl grey silk. So she gets two dresses uh, and they are the ones that she wants. So in the end, actually, she does get quite a lot. She does uh, force him to back down. But... Uh, she doesn't like the situation. She doesn't like the way he's trying to dress her up in fine clothes and put on jewellery because she feels she's, she's not like that. That's not, that's not who she is. Um, but it's still not finished because after that they go, uh, yeah, to, they go to a jeweller's and uh, the more he bought me, the more my cheek burned with a sense of annoyance and degradation. She doesn't feel that she's being treated like a princess or something. She actually feels that she's... He, he's treating her as a possession and dressing her up like some kind of doll and uh, forcing her to have these jewels. And it, it just creates a sense of annoyance and degradation in her. Uh, so uh, Jane Eyre is very much about those kinds of power relations that uh, I said would be an important part of the course all the way through, and which we have seen. Um, it, it, Jane Eyre kind of focuses on those kinds of... Who, can, who controls who here? Uh, so, the East had been used as a symbol of um, the oppression of women in European discourse, uh, really for, but part, as a result of colonial experiences. People had seen the East, they'd seen those harems of, the, of, of um, you know, um, Middle Eastern women and so on. And uh, in Mary Wollstonecraft, she, she, she does the same thing. She, she says, sort of saying, we're supposed to be, um, you know, superior so why are we still doing those kinds of things, like um, those um, repressed uh, societies of the East? So that she'll talk about women's limbs and faculties are cramped with worse than Chinese bands in, 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 in English society. We're, we're actually doing, you know, the Chinese put those, used to put those bands on, on women's feet to prevent their feet from growing because they considered that small feet were delicate. Um, well, we're, what we're doing, the way we're restraining women is, is worse than that, because it's a sort of psychological restraint. We don't put physical bands on them, but, but we restrain them uh, psycho psychologically. Western women are educated in worse than Egyptian bondage. Their taskmasters, their masters are worse than Egyptian taskmasters. So again, there's this comparison with the Middle East, uh, with the Eastern sort of attitude towards women being represented as being... Um, repressive, and we're supposed to be better than that. It's sort of this, this cultural assumption that because we're white, because we're colonial power, because of who we are, we shouldn't be able to compare ourselves with that kind of barbaric treatment. Um, it's a sort of an appeal to uh, men to say, You're, this is supposed to be a civilised society, why aren't you behaving in a civilised way? Something like that. And, yeah, of course, this is the sort of uh, harem, harem that, uh, you know, that, that Jane is, uh, she feels she's being kind of treated like uh, one of these women and that the sultan is the sort of lord who, who, who kind of controls her. So, basically, you can see that there are two narratives going on here. You've got a narrative of empire and uh, colonialism, and you've got a narrative of, of gender. So, it's the way that those two 
interact. Uh, and I want to give a sort of basically a, 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 um, a gender politics kind of approach today so that we can see how that works out when we look at a text of this kind. I'm going to come straight out at the beginning here. Bronte is racist. I, mean, I don't think we can get away from that. We might want to say, okay, but so was everybody in those days or something. They didn't have our kind of attitudes of political correctness or our uh, sense that we should treat people, you know, we should consider people to be kind of, of an equal humanity. She, she does equate uh, that which is foreign with that which is wrong or, or bad. It comes out again and again in her writing. Whatever uh, foreign culture is about, whatever it represents, whatever it advocates, well, that's what Jane has to oppose. That's what she has to overcome. Um, the, the little girl that Jane has gone to, you know, be the governess for, uh, is turns out to be a French girl, Adele. And uh, she... Rochester isn't quite sure whether she's his own daughter or not because the woman that he was with uh, seemed to be sleeping with other men. That's why he left her. Um, but Adele is quite... She said it was his child and he, he's looking after the girl. Um, but uh, she's grown up in France. It's only recently that Rochester's gone and brought her back to England. Uh, and basically, the way that, that the novel describes it, she has to be saved from this terrible mistake that she made of being French. Okay? Please note the irony in my, <laughs> in my voice here, okay? Uh, she has to be assimilated to English standards of behaviour. I mean, at the end of the novel, it actually says that a sound English education corrected, in a great measure, her French defects. And that's saying it as clear as it is, you know, as, as possible. Uh, she needs an English education because, unfortunately, she suffers from Frenchness. And that has to be educated out of her. So, uh, you get it very clearly there. Um, of course, you know, France isn't a colony, but, but we'll talk about France and England's relationship, which is rather special. will come to that in a minute. Um, basically, though... Uh, by being French, by being foreign, Adele is really in a very unfortunate position. Jane is sorry for her. We get the impression that Charlotte Bronte is sorry. And uh, again, later on in the novel, when uh, Jane, um, uh, uh, well, during her period as working as a governess, uh, she finds that her aunt is dying and she goes back to her aunt's home and her cousin Eliza announces her intention to go to France and embrace the tenets of Rome. That is, she's going to become a Catholic. Again, this is a terrible thing. You're going to become a Catholic? You're going to, it's, it's like you're a sort of uragirimon or you're a traitor to your culture, to your kind, to your, to your society, to, your, to, to everything that, that Jane believes in. And again, we suppose that Bronte agrees with Jane in this. And so Jane says, you're not without sense, cousin Eliza. But, but what you have, I mean, what sense you have, I suppose in another year we'll be walled up alive in a French convent. What are you thinking of? Okay, how could you possibly want to do that? So, again, uh, you've got this kind of feeling, um, it, it's somehow, it's just wrong. It's just wrong. I mean, we're English, we don't do that. So, and we're not Catholics. We just don't do that sort of thing. Uh, as I say, France wasn't part of the British Empire, but uh, it's important in this context because it was uh, England's great rival. It was Britain's great rival as an empire builder. It was, um, you know, France uh, was attempting to create its own empire through Napoleon, and Napoleon was building an empire inside Europe, as well as having colonies, you know, around the world, uh, France was building up its own empire by attacking various countries inside Europe and uh, taking over other countries in Europe. And, of course, the threat to England, uh, to Britain, was very direct. 
the up until the end of the Napoleonic Wars, which would have been when Jane was about four years old, uh, and Bronte hadn't yet been born at that time. Um, there was a direct threat that France would invade Britain, would invade England. And uh, they had people watching the coast at night to see whether the French ships might be coming across. So France was the enemy. All right, so it to some extent explains Bronte's anti-French attitudes here. The, the, the countries historically had been at war. They'd been enemies. And of course... The French Revolution was the one thing that the English were terrified of. If that happens here, you know, that's going to be the end of our society. So, as I said last week, when it came to reform, uh, the reform was all on the, the idea of give the people enough to stop them having a revolution. Okay? Don't, don't let things happen here the way they happened in France. Uh, but, uh, yeah, now we come to Bertha. This is the real kind of meat of the whole issue, that in order for Jane to succeed and get what she wants and marry Rochester herself, Bertha is going to have to die. As I said, she can't be got rid of through a divorce or any other means. As long as she is alive, Jane cannot marry Rochester. So the story is set up in such a way that uh, Jane's success can only come through Bertha's basic failure, that she has to die. Um, and on the other hand, it's uh, Jane's uncle in Madeira, John Eyre, who uh, gives her his fortune. When he dies, he, he leaves all his money to Jane. Uh, and he also saves her from that marriage to Bertha. How did, how did Bertha's brother know to come to the church at that time? It was through Jane's uncle. He didn't know that, that uh, he didn't know, you know, that, that uh, Mason was Bertha's brother, but Mason was a friend of, a colleague of his, and uh, so he... Uh, he tells Mason what's going on, and Mason realizes, oh, my God, that's my sister. Okay? He, uh, he, he, the man who's married my sister is trying to marry another woman. So, um, by, by making John heir, by making this man who's gone, uh, again, in, in a kind of colonial way to Madeira, um, the agent of uh, supporting Jane through money and... Uh, warning Jane away from the danger of making a, a bigamous marriage, uh, that kind of implies somehow that, uh, that he's right. He's right to be a, a, a colonial... Um, that, that kind of colonialism, it has a good effect on Jane, Jane's life. So there's a sort of implication that there's something right about that. That's okay. Uh, I'll come back to that a little bit in a minute. Uh, but I want to just look at the sort of irony, really, of um, Jane as juxtaposed with, with Bertha. She's working in the house. She often goes up to the top of the house. Um, Bertha, of course, is locked up in the attic. near the, and, and it's quite often when she goes up in, into that area that she hears a strange laugh. Well, she goes up there, she's working as a governess, and she, she, she thinks, while she's up there, one of the famous passages, one of the most famous passages of the book, um, she says pretty much the same sort of thing as Mary Wollstonecraft was saying about women. Um, she says, uh, you know, she's thinking to herself that uh, women feel just as men feel. They need exercise for their faculties. They need a field for their efforts as much as their brothers do. She's thinking these thoughts, um, her famous sort of um, soliloquy about women's rights. And she goes on to think, um, she develops the idea, saying to herself, uh, they, they, they suffer, uh, women that is, suffer from too rigid a restraint, too absolute a stagnation, precisely as men would suffer. And it is narrow-minded in their more privileged fellow creatures. 
they're more privileged fellow creatures, meaning men. It's narrow-minded uh, of men to say that they ought to confine themselves to making puddings and knitting stockings, to playing on the piano and embroidering bags. Okay, this is the frustration of a woman, an intelligent woman, in a society that doesn't have much use for intelligent women. So says, go and make a pudding, darling. Okay? Ah! Okay? She's so frustrated by it. Um, it is thoughtless to condemn them or laugh at them if they seek to do more or learn more than custom has pronounced necessary for their sex. All right? It's... Um, they feel that if they try to step outside their accepted sphere, they get laughed at, they get mocked by men. So, uh, she's expressing that frustration. Well, it's ironic that from that very same roof, Bertha Mason will meet her death. She uh, sets fire to her husband's house and throws herself to her death from the top of that same roof. And her path, where she goes from, well, she, supposedly from lustfulness, I mean, that's one of the things that uh, Rochester criticizes her for, he says that she's, she's got a very lustful uh, sexual appetite. Uh, we assume that he means that she would, you know, flirt with other men. Um, somehow she's dirty-minded. There's something dirty about her sexuality, uh, which he implies several times. Uh, her path from lustfulness to madness and death is, is the uh, diametric opposite to Jane's path, which is from her childish passion to reason and self-control. So they're taking kind of opposite paths in life. And so uh, the two of them set together there, both of them up on that roof, is quite a, an ironic contrast. And there's not much sense, really, that, you know, what she just said, women feel just as men feel. Okay? They suffer frustration from constraint. There's not much sense that that applies to Bertha. All right? She applies it to herself. She might apply it to a certain extent to Adele or to other w women, but it doesn't seem to apply to Bertha. It doesn't seem to occur to... How, what about her locked up like that? Okay? And that's partly because she's mad. But, I mean, we'll look at madness later on. Wouldn't you go mad if somebody locked you up in a room like that? I mean, how mad is she? Okay, that, that's a, the, the, another question. Okay, for today we'll just, just sort of accept um, the uh, judgment that she's mad and just look at it from, um, a, um, in terms of uh, colonial discourse and um, her, her, her kind of ethnic, ethnic identity. So, yeah, the novel in itself is, about, is, is largely about this, about passion and control. And that you could say that's a basic theme of what Jane Eyre is all about. It's got this passionate little girl who grows up and learns how to control herself. Um, and at the same time, it's got this wild, untamable Creole woman who's in direct contrast to the protagonist. And you could say that's the sort of central dynamic of the novel, really. And uh, the juxtaposition of the two, putting those two together, is what gives the novel a lot of its um, kind of power. And Janie, you know, Janie always comes across as a, as a you know, kind-hearted person. She thinks, of, you know, but she, she doesn't say very much about it. She just says... Um, poor Bertha, you know, she can't help being mad. It's not her fault. Uh, in, much in the same way as she says, you know, it's not Adele's fault uh, that she that she's um, you know an illegitimate child. That that uh, what you what her mother and what what you what you did uh, in having a baby without being married, and, and poor Adele has to grow up as um, an, an illegitimate child, which is a big disadvantage in Victoria. So it's not her fault. And she says these things. Uh, to, to sort of present the other side of the story. But, you know, in the end, uh, the message is that, that Bertha, has to, it, Bertha fails because she, doesn't, she can't control her passion. She can't control her wildness. She's not, um, she's not doing what Jane is doing. Jane is learning how to control herself, how not to scream, um, shout, and 
Uh, Jane, of course, is locked up. I, I haven't mentioned that here, but it's, it's, it's relevant. She, she herself gets locked up as a little girl for her wild behaviour. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll go on a little bit and then I'll, I'll take a break, all right, so you can just sort of gather your thoughts. Um, yeah. It, it's this dynamic, once you actually look for it, um, the, you know, gender and imperialism and how they work out between them, uh, once you're actually looking for it, you can see it all through the book, right, almost from the very beginning. The, the, book, the story begins with Jane sitting in a little window seat in her aunt's house. Um, she's been told to go away from the rest of the family because she's a nasty little girl and, they don't, and the aunt doesn't like her. And her two cousins... Uh, uh, sorry, three cousins, two sisters and, and, the, and the little boy, they come and they sort of try to bully her, or they do bully her. Uh, she's trying to sit there peacefully reading, uh, but they won't give her peace. So she's hiding away from the reeds at the beginning of the story, and it says that she sits cross-legged like a Turk. Okay, so she, Jane, is sitting cross-legged in that window seat like a Turk. Okay, that's the first thing, that she is like a Turk. Now, the use of that image, Turk, is some critics have seen that it, that's saying that she's an outsider. She doesn't belong to the family. She's an outsider. She's a Turk. She's, she's, but, but it also, uh, the Turks would have the um, image for English people at that time of being wild, kind of untamed sort of people themselves. They, they, they were outside control. They, the, the Turkish Empire had been attacking Europe for hundreds of years. And it, it, the idea of, of Turkish people was, that would filter through to England would be of uh, very kind of wild, you know, untamable kind of people. So, so Jane is, at this stage, a little bit like, you know, she's like Bertha, she's wild and untamed, but she's only a little girl. And she needs to be brought under control. This is the sort of Victorian morality coming in. Little children have to learn how to behave themselves. Um, and indeed, uh, someone does come along and try and bring her under control. Her, um, her cousin, John Reed, attempts to bring her under his control. He comes and he actually hits her with a book and makes her bleed. And it's, she says, you're like a slave driver. You're like the Roman emperors. So there's a direct comparison between him and the Roman emperor and her and a Turk. Okay, it, it's sort of set up very, you know, when you look for it, you realize this dialogue, this narrative is going on all through the book. And so the, the passionate Jane, the little Turk, fights off John Reed, the cruel slave driving Roman. Now, that, that sort of works very well because uh, in historical fact, the Romans did attack Turkey 2,000 years ago. So it, it, it kind of, it, it fits. Okay, just as Rome attacked Turkey, so John Reed attacks uh, little Jane. And she's the wild little thing fighting him off. But he's the cruel uh, you know, slave driver, the cruel Roman emperor. So that, that sort of um, dynamic of colonialism, and the, 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 at this point, Jane is like the colonized, okay, attacked by the, inv the, the colonizing invader. Okay, she is, in that early stage of the story, she's like the one that's being colonized in the sense that she's the victim of um, John Reed's aggression. But as we see as the story goes on, she's happy enough to engage with the British Empire at a, at a number of levels. And the first one that we saw was uh, Madeira, so I'll come back to that now in a little bit more detail. But it's basically Portuguese. And it always has been. And it is still basically Portuguese now. But uh, during the early part of the 19th century, during the time of the Napoleonic Wars, it was uh, a part of the British Empire. Just for a few years. And the reason that the British... Uh, took it over at that stage was to prevent Napoleon 
from gaining a foothold. So that the only reason they, they took it was to, to stop Napoleon. They didn't take it for themselves or for to, you know, any other sort of reason, just to, to kind of protect it from being uh, made into a foothold for Napoleon. And then when the wars ended, they just simply gave it back and said to Portugal, there you go, the risk is over, the danger's over, we came to protect the islands against that risk, uh, uh, and, that, and that, now the risk is gone, we're off again. So bye-bye, thank you very much, uh, you know, ho ho hope, hope it's all been okay for you, uh, seems to have worked out fine for us. So you know, that, that, it seems that the British are very, just very kind people who, who just go to, to Madeira to help. What nice guys. They just went to Madeira to, to help out during a time of crisis. Oh, and um, yeah. They were protecting their economic interests as well. It didn't technically belong to them, but they ruled its, they, they controlled its economy. Until quite recently, actually. The British ran the economy of Madeira from the end of the 17th century right up until sometime around the middle of the 20th century. So they were... Um, it was economic colonialism. They didn't politically control that land, except for those few years under Napoleon, uh, where, uh, in the time of Napoleon, uh, but they economically controlled it. And John Eyre would have been there in about 1821. That would be seven years after Napoleon was defeated. It would be when Jane was 11 years old, and he made a fortune in the wine business. Madeira is famous even today for its wines. But those wines, the whole wine business was built up largely by the British. So choosing Madeira as a location for John Eyre, it emphasizes Britain as a, an economic and trading empire, and it also emphasizes Britain's um, positive role in opposing France and Napoleon. So it, it, it's not one of those places where there's kind of very much controversy about uh, Britain's role, well, th there might be an, a certain amount of control, but it's not like one of those places where they went in and kind of killed people and uh, insisted on, you know, forcing their, their control uh, in, in an area where they weren't wanted. Uh, it was a very friendly sort of relationship with, with Madeira. And the British period of control was a time, you know, it, was, it was with Portugal's agreement. Portugal said, well, yeah, we don't want Napoleon. If you, can help, if you guys can help out, please, you know. Uh, go ahead. So it was never like the sort of, you know, attacking, aggressive kind of situation. So her choice of Madeira kind of really shows the sort of gentle, positive side of the empire. And uh, it's... It comes into the story in this way. It's got a particularly... Um, healthy climate, or it was said to have a particularly healthy climate. So um, Richard Mason, who is himself a Creole, he's come to England. He's uh, wanted to visit his sister and to see how she is. He, he loved his sister. I mean, he cares about his sister. He's very upset at what's happened to her. He accepts that she's mad. He doesn't disagree about that. Um, and he's come to England uh, to find out what's, you know, is, how is she? Uh, he gets a terrible shot because he, he, he tries to see her and she attacks him. She bites him severely. Okay, she, he, 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 um, he suffers a severe injury because she attacks him. Um, then on his way back to Jamaica, he stops off in Madeira to recover his health. And it's there that he, he meets uh, John Eyre. Jane's uncle. Uh, he's a business colleague. And Jane has written a letter back to John Eyre, to her uncle, because it's a little bit complicated, okay? Uh, let me try and explain. Jane has an aunt who hated her, and she grew up with that aunt for a few years. And then the aunt sent her off to school. Now, 
Years later, Jane hears that her aunt is dying. So she goes to her aunt's home and uh, sees her on her deathbed. And the aunt says, Jane Eyre, you've always been a terrible trouble to me. I always hated you so much. You were such a terrible child. And uh, I have to make a confession now that I'm dying. There's a letter from your uncle in Madeira. And he's saying that he wants to uh, adopt you and look after you as if, he was a, as if you were his daughter, because he hasn't got any family. And so Jane, uh, when she makes this arrangement, uh, engagement to marry Rochester, she's feeling, oh God, Rochester's this high-class gentleman. I'm a, I'm a low-class governess. Maybe my uncle would help me out. If I had a bit of independent money, if I could come to the marriage, not just as a governess, but as somebody who had some family money, as somebody who had some status, I'll write to my uncle in Madeira, see if he can help me. He seems to want me to be his daughter. Let's see what happens. So uh, John Eyre knows that his niece, Jane Eyre, is going to marry Rochester. He tells it to Mason, and Mason says, oh my God, Rochester's already married to my sister. I've, I've just been bitten by her. I'm, <laughs> so uh, he knows that, 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 that she's still alive. So uh, that's why he comes back with a lawyer and stops the marriage, as we saw in the little video uh, section that we did at the beginning of the class. So that's what's going on there. All right, now let's move on to Bertha and focus directly on her. And um, Rochester, basically, he benefits economically from Britain's trading empire in the same way as John Eyre does, or in a, perhaps not quite the same way, because uh, he, he, uh, he, he gets the money by marrying a Creole woman, whereas John Eyre gets it by working in the wine business. So it's through marrying a Jamaican Creole that he comes into a fortune. And the family are willing to give him their daughter and £30,000. And the reason is because he is of good race. All right, there's a specific reference to ethnicity. Uh, he's of good race. And of course, the implication there is that Bertha is. Uh, as a Creole, is racially inferior to uh, the white um, Rochester. Um, and that word Creole is a vague term, like I said at the beginning of the class. It can be used in different ways, in different societies, but it, it, in every context that it occurs, uh, it, it refers to the descendant of white settlers who had some admixture of black blood. Um, she's obviously in the Caribbean context, and that's what it would mean in the Caribbean context. Uh, sometimes it's more of a language thing. A lot of Creoles are French-speaking because uh, the early settlers were French and they mixed in with the local populations much more. Um, so sometimes, Cre if you check Creole, if you Google up Creole, it'll very often come up with a language rather than a race or a ethnicity of people. But uh, here it's, it's used in the sense of um, descendants of white settlers uh, who are kind of racially mixed in with... Uh, in, in different contexts, it could be Native American or it could be you know, other ethnic groups, but uh, in the Caribbean context, usually uh, black blood. And uh, Bertha uh, Rochester describes her as having been very beautiful at the time that he married her. But uh, now she's gone mad. She's locked up in Rochester's attic. She's said to have a goblin appearance and a pygmy intellect. Well, pygmy, of course, the pygmies are, are an African race. So again, there's a, a racial kind of insult there, a pygmy intellect. Uh, are pygmies particularly stupid? I don't know. I don't think so. It just uh, he, he uses that word um, kind of unthinkingly. And her face is variously described as black and purple. So 
Uh, and, and she's got um, long black hair as well. So uh, she's, she's, whatever she is, she's, she's dark, she's um, alien, she's not, she's not, she's very un-English. That's the, that's the real thing about her. Um, and when he marries her, he finds that, you know, she's not his character. He thought he loved her because, it, you know, she was beautiful and young. And uh, then when he married her, he found, uh, he says she was coarse, she was trite, perverse, and imbecile, okay, a very low intellect. And uh, so she was uneducated and possibly uh, couldn't be educated. She was uh, uneducable. And she's got a violent and unreasonable temper. And the other thing he finds out after marrying her is that insanity runs in the family. That uh, that's the other reason for sort of supposing that that, that uh, there is some uh, actual madness here. It's not just not just to say, oh, she's very different from me. I'll I'll, do, I'll, I'll consider her insane. Um, her, her, her mother and her grandmother had all um, ended up uh, mad, whatever that means. And so finally, uh, she goes mad too, and she has to be locked up. That's at least the way that Rochester presents it to Jane, and that's the way it comes through to the readers. So there you go, the crazy uh, Bertha. And her craziness finds its ultimate expression in burning down Rochester's house. And uh, in the course of that, she, 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 she kills herself or she, she dies. So fire becomes a symbol, fire is, is, is a symbol of her wild passion and uh, in the end she burns down the house and kills herself and blinds Rochester. Yeah. Rochester's blinding is, is something again we can take a look at here. It, it has um, symbolic significance. She's wild, she's untamed, she's un-English. Adele, at least, can be cured of her... <laughs> okay, again, please note the irony in my voice. Cured of her foreignness. Uh, but Bertha, is, 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 she's gone beyond that. There's no way to get her to, to um, conform to the expectations of an English society woman. But as I say, we never hear her voice. We don't know what she says. And uh, the only way she exists for the reader is the way that she's presented through the filter of Rochester and Jane. And, of course, through her own uh, actions, um, which do seem to be the product of madness. I mean, her strange laugh, her nighttime escapades, the way she attacks people and property. Uh, she seems to be mad. But... Uh, it would be men who decided that, Rock, that, that, that Bertha was mad. It would be a man's decision. And so that, again, is a gender issue. And we'll be looking at madness uh, in another lesson, make that the focus of our um, sort of um, study uh, in, a, in a, another lesson. So if she could tell a story, she might tell a different sort of story. And there's... Uh, Wide Sargasso Sea, which was published in 1966, written by a Creole woman, Jean Rees, which is a famous example of post-colonial fiction, what's called talking back. The, the, the person who was silenced under the colonial regime now has a voice, now speaks back, now says, yeah, well, thank you so much, you know, for telling the story. Now I'm going to tell the story my way. Um... So giving a voice to those colonized people whose voices were kept silent during the time of the empire. And so with um, post-colonial criticism and uh, talking back are, are an important part of uh, looking at um, 
literature since the end of the British Empire. And you know, we, we, when we're doing this, we, we sometimes students kind of talk about Bertha as if she was a real person, and what the real story of Bertha. Bertha's just a, a, a fictional character. Okay, she doesn't have a real identity as such. Um, but we can ask, you know, is how reliable is Jane in presenting uh, Bertha? So I think there's a, a, an important difference between thinking of Bertha as somehow a real person, and Jane's not telling us the truth about this real person, but, or, or the line between that and, and Jane as a narrator of the story, how much we can trust Jane's re telling, how, how much we can trust the way that she tells the story, the way that she presents the characters. Um, it's very significant that when she is... Uh, being mistreated by her aunt, she actually understands her aunt's way of thinking. She says, yeah, of course she hated me. Of course, how could she really like an interloper not of her race? She actually thinks it's quite natural for her aunt not to like her. She is using race here, of course, to mean uh, family. But you can see that, that this reflects Jane's own thinking and possibly Bronte's thinking. How can anybody really like somebody who's not, you know, Uchi? How can they like a Yos or, you know, a foreigner or, or somebody outside their group? Okay? She's got this kind of hei sateki way of thinking. And Jane herself accepts it as natural. She understands her, her aunt's dislike of her. I'm not her blood. I'm not her, you know, I'm not her family. I'm just, you know, my parents have died and... and uh, um, my aunt has taken me on, but she's not, she's not a blood relative. All right? She's, she's related to me by marriage, not by blood. Hello? Seems to be trying, not succeeding today. Come on. There you go. Um... Yeah, she's using the uh, race as family. Uh, and when she comes to know that the Rivers family are her cousins, it's, it's a huge thing for her. Oh, I've got, you know, I've got uh, my own Uchi group. I've got blood relatives. Uh, but in the wider sense, too, uh, race, of course, obviously, uh, in, the, in the novel, the word race is used in, in everything ranging from meaning member of your family to meaning a member of the human race. And uh, Sinjin, who is another character we're going to have to look at before we finish here today, is uh, he, he has an open idea of, or much bigger idea of race, and he adopts uh, India as his race. And he, it, again, it's called his race. And he goes as a missionary to save his race as he sees it. Uh, and she, she says that, that Sinjin, she calls him Great Heart with a big G. He is a great heart. And, and she's not. So he's got a broader sense, supposedly, of humanity. So I want to look at you know, the, the, the ideas of race that we're getting from the early Victor from the Victorian period and from, from Bronze. Um, by turning now to this character, Sinjin, uh, it looks like Saint John, by the way, but it's pronounced Sinjin. Um, he's kind of key, really, in some ways, he, or at least he completes the picture. We've got, uh, we've got three men now. Uh, we've got Rochester, we've got John Eyre, and we've got St. John. And they're all connected with empire and colonialism and gender. So they're all part of this kind of narrative. And he's a good guy, I and mean, she thinks he's a good man. She, you know, she, she praises him as a good man. But at the same time, he's very cold. He has no passion. Or if he does have any passion, he represses it mercilessly. He, he does not express his passion. Uh, especially in, in uh, terms of sexuality, he, he proposes to Jane even though he doesn't love her. Because he thinks that she'll be suitable for him in his work as a missionary. She's the kind of woman who would be a missionary's wife. And um, there's a beautiful 
and rich woman in the neighborhood who, who makes him flush and kindle, who makes him, he, he obviously he's attracted to her, but he rejects her. He cannot imagine taking her to India, and since his purpose in life is to be an Indian, a missionary in India, uh, a beautiful rich woman like that wouldn't go with him, so he won't marry her. So he turns down a woman he's obviously very attracted to. <coughs> And he gives his life as a missionary in India, doing what he thinks of as, as God's work. And Jane clearly also thinks it's God's work. Uh, and then he wears himself out and dies. Right? It's too tough. It's a very tough climate. He, he works and works and works at that, distracting himself from any other, you know, anything else, any other uh, human feelings he might have. This is his mission. And uh, he kills himself uh, within 10 years of kind of overwork as a missionary. So let's put those things together and try and make some sense out of it now, just to wrap things up. And the Victorians loved moralizing. So this is sort of, they usually, their, their writings contain some sort of moral message. So uh, I think it's reasonable to assume that there's some sort of moral message going on in what uh, Bronte is telling us here. Rochester? He pays. He pays a high price. His £30,000 do not come cheap. They bring him 15 years of misery and, uh, and, of, and in the end he's blinded and he, he, he's wounded um, through the fire and through trying to rescue Bertha. I mean, we can say that Bertha suffers even worse, that she pays an even higher price, but, but just focusing on him... The novel makes him pay. Bronte makes him pay. Which implies that he's done something wrong, doesn't it? Okay, He's having to pay for, for, for doing something wrong. Um, he's gone to the colonies. He's taken a woman for himself and for his own gain because he gets money as well as the woman. He seems rather not too, too different from the Turkish uh, Sultan or the Roman Empire. Emperors. I mean, they went out and they got what they wanted for their own gain. All right? And he's, he's punished for that in the novel. And he, his blindness can be linked to the biblical story of the blind, blindness of Paul. Um, it's the price of his redemption. For him to get his soul back, for him to get back his, his true purity, he has to suffer. And, and he suffers blindness, which is uh, very much connected with the biblical story, I think, of St. Paul on the road to Damascus. He's struck blind so that he can see his inner self more clearly. And uh, blindness is not just to do with seeing, you know, um, purity, in a, in, uh, seeing one's own inner purity. It's, it's also connected with sexuality uh, in two uh, very um, kind of archetypal stories. The one is the story of Samson and Delilah, where that's the price that he pays for uh, his lust for women. Because he lusts for women, Samson uh, has his eyes put out. So that's the moral, the moral there. And Oedipus, uh, who puts out his own eyes in the Greek tragedy after learning that he's married his own mother. Okay, so uh, basically... Uh, Again, like Paul, they see God more clearly. They, 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 they're purified by their blindness, but their blindness is a sort of punishment for uh, inappropriate sexual feelings or inappropriate sexual relations. And so that really su that suggests, that going by that sort of archetypal analysis, it suggests that uh, Rochester's blindness has a similar sort of symbolism, that he's being punished for uh, his inappropriate sexual feelings, and uh, maybe he's, he comes closer to God at the end of the story. But, but his relationship with Bertha is inappropriate, and that's expressed through his blindness. That, that seems to be the kind of moral judgment that Bronte is passing there. Okay? So I'll try and uh, 
draw some conclusions about this, relating now to John, bringing John Eyre and uh, St. John into the picture. Just sum up what we've got there. John Eyre is um, unmarried. And uh, he has to be unmarried. It, it, the story wouldn't work if he was married. Because if he was married, his money would go to his children or to his wife uh, when he died. So he has to be unmarried uh, so that Jane can get his fortune. Uh, basically, he works, he, he makes money, and he passes on the money he earns to Jane, and Jane gets that money. There's no penalty here. It's all fine. Uh, the, only, the only sadness that he, he has to suffer is the fact that he's lonely, uh, and that comes from he quarrel, his quarrel with his brother. Uh, he doesn't give the money to his other um, family because he quarreled with his brother. He's got, he's got no wife or family of his own. So, so basically what's happening here is that instead of having a wife and family, he's got his you know, business his, and his, his trading. That's what he's got instead of a, a wife and family. If you like. That is his wife, okay, symbolically. And as I say, there's no penalty for that, and Jane benefits from, from John Eyre. So it's like... Uh, all the way through, basically what he's done is okay. Okay, he's the sort of middle point in between Rochester and St. John. Going by this analysis. Now, St. John. He's not like Rochester. He's not like John Eyre. Because he's not going to get anything from the empire, from the colonial expansion of, of, of Britain at this time. He's actually uh, giving rather than taking, or at least that's how he sees it. And that's how people of his time would see it. His aim is to give, to, to say these poor people, again, it's rather racist in its assumptions, okay? Uh, give these poor people what, what our, our culture, because we are culturally superior. So I'll give them our culture, give them our religion, uh, because... Poor people, they don't have the, the, the benefits that we have. They are, unfortunately, foreigners. Okay, so uh, what he wants to give, it may not be wanted by the Indian people, it may not be appreciated by the Indian people, um, and it, it can be seen, and probably from a modern point of view, largely would be seen as imposing his cultural values on others. I mean, the Indian people are sort of saying, sorry, but we've got our own religions that have been here for thousands of years. Well, why, why would we want your Christianity? You know, so, um, this sort of assumption that his religion is better than theirs and that, that uh, he's taking some sort of treasure to them uh, is something that we might want to question. But, but Jane and Bronte herself, they, they see his life as uh, a life of noble sacrifice. He's, he's giving these poor people what they don't have which is the benefits of our culture, our civilization, our society. But it comes at a huge price. Um, he's, he's, look at it, he's turned his back on uh, the, the legitimate pleasure, because there'd be nothing wrong with him marrying uh, a, a beautiful woman that he loves, you know, but he turns his back on that. No, he's going to uh, take on the greater good of humanity. He's got a task, you know, a great, great task that he's going to perform. Um, and he can't allow himself to have that uh, luxury or that pleasure of marrying a woman that he might love. Um, and he ends up bringing upon himself an early death. So what's the judgment, what sort of judgment have we got going on there? What's the message, basically? Well, setting out to foreign lands to conquer a woman and win a fortune is a grave mistake. I mean, that's really the same as the Turk, Tur Turks or the Romans. Um, even doing it at home was a mistake because uh, he, he has a sort of flirtation with a woman called Blanche Ingram who um, he actually compares to, to Bertha and again that's not appropriate just wanting a woman for, uh, her, se you know, for her sexual beauty uh, and, her, and her wealth is not that's, sorry, Jane's, Jane's not happy with that Bronte's not happy with that a woman should be valued for something more than that something other than that uh, so, uh, Rochester's got his kind of um, comeuppance. He has to pay a price. He learns. He learns his lesson, but he, he has to pay a sort of price. At the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, 
suppressing your desires and setting out to foreign lands to give rather than take, like um, St. Sin John does, well, that's a, a noble act of sacrifice, but ultimately it's uh, self-destructive and perhaps, it, it perhaps futile. And again, there's a slight mistake in the presentation, but I think you can see okay, um, what, what St. John's doing. Uh, it's not judged entirely pos positively either. In fact, Jane criticizes St. John uh, quite strongly for uh, proposing to her when he doesn't really love her. And uh, then you've got John Eyre, who's in the middle position, and uh, he gains materially but loses love and companionship. Basically, he, he has traded, he's traded a, wa a wife and family uh, for business. The business is his wife. Symbolically, uh, we could see it like this. Just think of it like this. Take the, take the colonial power gendered as male. Okay? And then take the colonized country as female. Where does that lead us? It leads us to Rochester rapes and pillages Jamaica through Bertha Mason. It's a kind of rape and pillage. Uh, John Eyre engages in a legal contract with Madeira. It's a kind of marriage. It's like Madeira and the whole kind of business set up there is his wife. And that's the one that's approved in the novel. Um, and uh, St. John, uh, he serves India, giving his all and sacrificing his life. It, I mean, it's, it gets kind of masochistic, okay, frankly speaking. All right. Uh, so uh, you've got, all right, you've got these three different power relationships. You've got these three different approaches to colonialism, and you've got... Uh, You've got these uh, kind of, in terms of uh, gender, you've, you've got these uh, three kind of dynamics going on in the novel. And it's the middle one. It's, it's the, the sort of uh, legitimate contract. It's the marriage that J John Eyre effectively has with Madeira that kind of uh, wins the day. And so that's, that's uh, what I wanted to show you today was not just gender in the novel, but uh, gender politics in literary analysis. That's how gender politics works in literature in, 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 when we're discussing literature. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we'll, we'll be back next week, and I think we'll be looking at madness next week, okay?